Yes, I love airships. I've always been, even when I was a kid, I liked the idea of airships because they look so fantastic. If there's one thing I could see from the past, I think it would be a really big Hindenburg style airship flying over a city, you know, flying over um, Frankfurt or London even. I think it would just look amazing. They don't fly very high airships because obviously they're not pressurized and so on. So they tended to biff around at sort of six, seven, eight thousand feet, which would have given you a fantastic view. And they're faster than ships going across the Atlantic, but obviously not as fast as a modern aeroplane. So a, a typical crossing on a big Zeppelin across the Atlantic could take two or three days, depending on the weather conditions. But that's just long enough to actually make the journey an enjoyable part of your trip. You, have, you know, have very elegant dining, a bit of singing around the piano made of aluminium to save weight. You couldn't smoke. Uh, the, uh, I think the Hindenburg had one room in it that was dedicated to smoking. It was asbestos lined and it had one petrol lighter like a Zippo, which was the only lighter allowed on the aircraft and it was chained to the table so nobody could take it out of the asbestos lined room. And that's where you're allowed to smoke. But I find the idea that it had something like eight and a half million cubic feet of hydrogen in it and the idea that somebody sitting, you know, 10 feet below all that was allowed to spark up a petrol lighter and have a big stogie is, I wouldn't have done it bloody terrifying. But the idea is great. I mean, airships, are it's got to be the most dignified form of transport ever conceived. It's better than a yacht, even. They just, they float serenely. They're not very affected by turbulence or anything like that. You just sit there and look out of the window. Fantastic. Very expensive. The price of a, of a transatlantic ticket from Frankfurt to, to, um, where the Hindenburg crashed, and I've just forgotten what it's called, Lakehurst, would have been the equivalent back in the 30s of buying a small flat, I think, or something like that. Air travel was hideously expensive. The, flying, the early flying boat trips were very expensive as well. But if you were wealthy, I think it would have been fabulous. And given that, you know, since, since the golden age, the 30s of the airship and the, and the Hindenburg disaster and so on, we've got... Um, better access to helium, much better materials for making the skin out of, which is one of the very inflammable parts, much better technology for working out the structure, much better materials for making the structure so we can make it stronger, lighter, only as strong as it needs to be without chronic over-engineering. I think a modern passenger airship, I'm not talking about the New Zeppelin ones which seat sort of 15, 20 people, I'm talking about a, a whopper 800 or 1,000 feet long. Storing them is a bit of an issue, I accept that. Uh, mm. Do you think air travel could do a bit more Zeppelin-like glamour? Well, I, th I think I would be very pleased to fly, say, between London and Bristol, or maybe, uh, maybe say, from Bristol over to Ireland in an airship that flew at low altitude. It didn't necessarily go very fast, but just gave you a, a, a lovely viewing experience. I think that would be... Tremendous. I, I can't see the problem with it. They're even quite energy efficient airships because they don't go fast enough to produce terrible drag. They're relatively low friction. You don't need massive engines to power a very, very big airship. They don't carry a lot of people. That's the main issue. But of course, on the original airships, because it was luxury travel, because all air travel was then, the, the number of staff on board was equal to the number of passengers. So it's, I think it was typically sort of, you know, 35 to 40 staff and maybe 40 passengers. So you virtually had a butler whilst you flew along. That's tremendous. And tell me, because I did not know this, uh, about the, the near naming of um, the Hindenburg and Hitler. Yes, the legend has it. Hugo Eckner, who took over the Zeppelin airship building company, he was a notorious pacifist and very strongly anti-Nazi. And he was very unpopular in the 30s for his anti-Nazi uh, anti sentiments. Um, and there was supposedly a plan to call the Hindenburg the Adolf Hitler, which he desperately didn't want because he was very anti-Hitler. So he named it the Hindenburg after Paul Hindenburg of the Weimar Republic before the Nazis could get their hands on it. And there is a theory that the, that the Hindenburg crash at Lakehurst was an act of sabotage by Nazi sympathisers. It's been largely discredited from what I can make out, but for a long time there was quite a lot of research done on the idea that 
Eckner really needed to be shamed for his incorrect non-Nazi views. And also by then, the, the, the sort of the German high command had recognized that the airship wasn't going to be very good for waging war anymore. The aeroplane was obviously the way forward. The Luftwaffe would be full of Heinkels and Dorniers, not Zeppelins. So it didn't matter if the airship was lost. And it was a good way of teaching Eckner a lesson. But I find that theory pretty hard to swallow because at a time when you know, National Socialism was very keen to promote itself around the world. I can't see why they would deliberately destroy one of their sort of flagship items, which was this massive 800 plus foot long airship. I, I can't see that they'd do that. I was going to say the other interesting thing about airships, for people who want to get into airships, is Neville Shute, the novelist, actually worked with Barnes Wallace on the design of the R100. Barnes Wallace of Bouncing Bomb and Dambusters fame. But prior to that, he worked on the R100, which was Britain's privately funded airship project. Um, Barnes Wallace was the chief engineer. Neville Shute was his chief calculator, as he was then called. He wrote a book called Slide Rule, all about building the airship and so on, and it's fantastic. But one of the difficulties of building a thing like an airship structure back then was that Obviously, it's made up of a series of frames, of octagonal or whatever shape, and they have to be made from drilled and punched aluminium pieces, and then they're braced longitudinally and across with wires that are under tension to keep the whole thing rigid. But every single point had to be worked out mathematically, and in those days, a calculator, what we'd now take to mean a little device that you put in your pocket, a calculator was a person, that was a job, being a calculator, and you sat there, and you did arithmetic, and there were thousands and thousands and thousands of calculations that had to be done on this whole massive structure to make sure that it would work. And if one of them was wrong, and of course one of them would be, because you wouldn't get them all right, you had to go back and pick your way through and try and work out where the mistake was. Now, if you, if you designed an airship today, finite element analysis, computers, and so on, would be able to work out exactly what shape it would be quite quickly and without over-engineering it, so it would be stronger and even lighter than it was. So. I mean, if they could do it back then with pencils and pieces of paper, we should be able to make a cracking airship these days. Um, it's well worth reading the Neville Shoot book. Neville Shoot and the town called Alice. Yeah, town called Alice, that's, yeah.